Hello, my name is Alan Froome, and today I'm going to talk about planning oil and gas wells, a geologist's contribution. Now, we geologists and ge other geoscientists have a key contribution in planning oil and gas wells. And effective planning helps effective delivery. Investing a lot of money here, we're talking tens, perhaps sometimes even hundreds of millions of dollars, and we need to do everything we can to get it as right as we can. Key point is safety is obviously the top priority. You know, have a, a rig on top of the well, can have as many as 100 people on it. You want to make sure that they all get home safely. We don't have any serious environmental incidents. We don't have any safety incidents. We want to get it right. And we also need to think about what's the objective of the well. You know, exploration, where you have data to solve risks or production. Today, I'm going to talk mainly about exploration wells, but some of this applies to production wells as well. And you have teamwork in well design execution. Sometimes that can be challenging, if particularly if uh, teams are located in different offices or sometimes different countries. We've got a big multicultural team, but you put it all together to make it all work. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of wells that you have. So um, I'm going to talk mainly about ENA wells, exploration appraisal, where the objective is data gathering. You can also have production wells where the objective is actually to produce hydrocarbons. Um, we have different types of wells. So for example, a finder well is a relatively cheap well, which gets you minimum essential data, so no core null testing. I'll talk a little bit about both of those two later uh, to just confirm the hydrocarbons are present, reservoir is present, and then you do a full full scale appraisal well later, which has all of that. Production wells, they can be inclined, horizontal, sometimes exploration wells can be inclined. Um, you have pilot holes within your drilling production wells, particularly drilling horizontal wells, just to be able to steer your horizontal well correctly and to get the most data before, to, in order to plan that. Uh, it can be quite hairy because there's quite a lot of uh, stuff you have to process in a relatively short time. Uh, side track is when you have multiple holes from the same, within the same borehole. Uh, you may have to, have to do that to a mechanical geological failure. You may do side tracks to get ex extra information. So, for example, you can go down dip to try to find a contact or up dip to find, to find a pinch out. And multilateral wells that have several uh, side tracks deliberately drilled that are all open for extra production. But uh, I'm going to talk about mainly ENA wells today. So, what are the objectives of the Indian well? Well, you need to find data. You have some questions to ask. You know, have you got any hydrocarbons? What sort of hydrocarbons are there? Are there any impurities? So getting a fluid sample if they have hydrocarbons. How good is the reservoir? Well, what's the thickness? What's the porosity? What's the net to gross ratio? What's the saturation? Can the hydrocarbons flow at necessary rates? Again, are you going to get an economic flow rate? Is there sufficient volume for development? Is our geological model somewhat correct? You'll never get it exactly right. Sometimes you get it very wrong, fortuitously or unfortuitously. Um, and what does the well have in terms of impact for other prospects in the play? So you move uh, from the one prospect into play scenario. So choosing a location. Well, first of all, you need to minimize the hazards that you can have. If you can't avoid them, you need to know where they are. Things like uh, shallow gas, faults, etc. So you get the casing set at the right time to ensure the safe operation of a well. Any surface location considerations, so you can move a well you know, several hundred meters on the terms of a surface location to ensure that things are done safely. How far down dip do you have to go to prove up volume? With potential side tracks that you might want to design in case of success. So a down dip to find a contact, finding pinch out, looking at different facies, etc. So try to get appraisal in early if that's possible. If it's not safely possible, then you obviously don't do it. So one of the tools we use for that is something called an area depth plot. So it's a graphical representation of volume. So here you have uh, depth below surface. Here you have area in square kilometers, which is a proxy for, for volume. And this is what you may have proven with your discovery well. So that's your bottom hole of the discovery well. You haven't found a contact. You've got an all down two. Well, where are you going to put the next appraisal well to try to see where your contact could be? So again, that's a tool that you use to make decisions. Even for an exploration well, you see how much volume you might need to prove up with, uh, with well one. You'll never drill a well at the crest because of pressure issues and the volume you'll prove up there is so minimal that it's kind of not really worth it. You just have to do more appraisal wells. So you try to go as down dip as you reasonably can, and you look at what's possible there. Obviously, HSC is critical because you need to ensure that you deliver the well safely. So how can we geologists contribute to safety? Well, we can identify hazards. We can plan our operations with safety in mind, and obviously we follow safety uh, protocols. And also, we need to ask questions. There are things that we don't know. There are things that we don't understand. If you don't understand, ask. People will almost always be delighted to help you to reassure you, because that's how we work. So some examples of uh, 
uh, shallow hazards that you need to look at. I've got a video on that on my channel. Please have a look at that one. So looking at things like polygonal faulting, shallow gas pockets, uh, sand bodies that are potentially overpressured, uh, faults, etc. And we use um, seismic uh, tools to try to find all of these things and try to make sure that we do well as safely as we possibly can. Another one is pore pressure. So pore pressure is the pressure of the fluid within the pores in a porous uh, rock. So you have uh, a lithostatic gradient, which is the pressure at which the rock breaks, which the rock fractures. Hydrostatic gradient is if, the, if the, all the pores are filled with water. So if your pressure is a little bit above hydrostatic gradient, that says that your uh, fluid is overpressured. If it's below that, which is very rare, it's under pressured. So the key here is to try to stay within this zone when you're drilling a well. So doing a pressure plot is very important. And we sometimes we use seismic data, particularly low velocities, when you have a new normally low velocities, because that can help predict uh, overpressure. So you need to understand that. In order to control our pressure, uh, we have some fluids called the drilling mud, which is a fluid within the borehole. Drilling mud can be either oil-based or water-based or the water-based polymer. Again, uh, mud choice depends on the geology and regulations. You want to try to use oil best as little as possible because it does have some HSE issues, uh, but sometimes uh, geological safety can override other issues and, uh, and you have to go oil base. The weight of the mud is its density. It's the main control in the well pressure. Uh, it's normally measured in pounds per gallon because it comes out of the American oil field. And high PPG mud can cope with higher pressure, but if you uh, mud weight is too heavy, you'll get invasion of the formation, which is not a good thing. So you want to stay on balance where the mud weight exerts enough pressure to stop fluids coming in, but uh, the mud invading the formation. That can be quite challenging. Again, please talk to experts uh, that can give you um, specific uh, things on drilling mud. Well prognosis is something a, ge a geologist does before well, so this is uh, what we thought was going to happen before. This is what happens after. Uh, geophysicist supplies formation tops, so you uh, estimate where the formation was likely to come in. You have some uncertainty brackets, you know, it will be 50 meters up, 100 meters down, for example. Uh, and you have lithologies from regional geology. So you try to figure out what is going to be ahead of the drill bit so that uh, the drillers can anticipate what happens. Now, sometimes you get it wrong, uh, which can be a bit embarrassing for the geologist, but you need to try to get as much uncertainty in there, try to understand it. Okay, so now comes to the data gathering. So what data do we need to get answers to that? So what do we need to run? Uh, do we run LWD or wineline logs or both? Do we need to do borehole seismic? Do we need to do image logs? Do we need to core? Uh, biostratigraphy is kind of almost a given, but you can have an on-site biostratigrapher that gives you very accurate ages of rocks uh, as we drill through them. So, for example, if you try the geosteer, a biostratigrapher can be extremely valuable in that sort of situation. Uh, what pressure tools do you need to have? Um, MDT, RFT, the various acronyms for the same sort of tool. They, they do tend to vary, and some of them tend to be more advanced. And do you need to run a well test or a DST? So I'm going to talk a little bit about most of these in a minute. The key thing here is what are your company and government regulations? So what data is required? So it's cost and safety versus data. So that's an equation you have to, to, to make. Um, obviously, if something is not safe, you don't do it. Uh, something's very expensive, you might choose not to do it. And you have to balance all of that. So what information will the data give us and what decisions we need to make? So you look at that. So first of all, let's have a quick look at wireline logs or LWD, which is logging while drilling. So you need to choose an appropriate logging program. So you need to say, for example, you'll have a gamma ray log as a given to give you some lithology control, resistivity logs that'll give you some ideas of fluids. You might run a sonic log, which gives you lithology and gives you porosity. You'll have uh, potentially neutron and density, so that's and fine row B. However, these are nuclear tools with nuclear sources. They give you a little bit of extra risk. It's manageable, but again, you need to see how you can do. And how many of these tools can you combine in each logging run? Now we have some advanced tools, for example, things like this um, formation images, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance tools. They may be quite expensive, so do you really need them? And obviously you might have to do some logging in the top hole sections to give you data for the overburden. Now again, the choice of logs that you tend to run will also be dependent on what you encounter. So for example, if you've got no reservoir, you're not going to bother running things like the image log. 
if you've got no hydrocarbons, you may, but you're having a reservoir but no hydrocarbons, you may choose to again trim your logging program as a result of that. But you need to have the tools available uh, either on the rig or on nearby standby so you can get them to the rig within 24, 48 hours. And you need to design your specific um, logging program in order to try to answer the questions that you that you will have. Uh, one particular, well, I am a geophysicist, so yes, it is a favorite of mine, is borehole seismic. So this is what links seismic data to, to well data. You lower a special sensor uh, down the down the borehole. You will have a recording uh, a record at the top that uh, records data from that. Then you have a seismic source. Now on land, you generally would tend to move um, something like a vibrosize or a or dynamite if you're allowed to do that uh, up and you know around the well. Um, offshore, it's a little bit more complicated because if you're going to do walk aboves or walk aways, you need a you need a boat. Normally, it's a supply boat, and you just hang a a source off the uh, off the back of that. But again, that costs money. It's a separate logging run, uh, depends on the whole condition, etc. Now, quite a lot you can get out of it. The resultant check shot will give you synthetic seismogram to give you a more accurate well ties and give you a corridor stack from the VSB, which gives you a very high, high fidelity trace, which you can then use to, to link with your seismic. And the walk aboves and the walk aways, as illustrated in this image here, can give you very high frequency uh, seismic which you can use for, to, to see what's going on around the well. Uh, you can also use it for prediction ahead of a drilling bed. A former colleague of mine, Chris uh, Chris Rolls, was drilling a well off Kenya. They were about to go into a reef and uh, they were using a head of bit seismic to try to predict exactly where the reef was going to be so that they can set casing. So he presented that to the AG conference, if you can look up, uh, look up his, uh, his paper. Again, um, very important but not always run. Again, depends on cost, depends on safety. Then you have core. Now, coring is effectively a tube of rock, and here's some examples here. So that's whole core. You can have resonated core, which are core slabs. You can have core plugs. You can get a lot out of core because it's a real rock sample. It's a real intact rock sample. It's done using a special coring drilling bit like this, and this is how it works. Effectively, you take up a solid core inside the side of this. Um, you get real porosity values, real permeability values. You can use the core for experiments, test rock and fluid behavior, special core analysis, rock mechanics, core flooding, etc. You know, it's pretty valuable. It's very expensive. Also use it for sedimentological analysis, structural analysis using fractures. It's very valuable, but it'll cost you. You have to install this new special bit. You can't use LWD while you're doing it uh, normally with most tools. Um, so again, and then when do you start coring? You need to make a decision when you are going to go into go in with a core bit. Maybe you have some evidence of a reservoir coming in and then you pull out, you change your bit, etc. That takes time. Um, again, very valuable, but expensive. Well, pressures. Again, you measure pressure inside the tool. And here's a, uh, a tool. So there are different types of tool. Uh, RFT, repeat formation tester, module dynamic tester, formation integrity tester. They're wireline tools that can also be used on, uh, on drill pipe. And they effectively give you uh, samples of fluid. So you can collect a real fluid sample. And it gives you pressures and you can plot them up. So this is a water gradient, this is a hydrocarbon gradient. You can work out where the free water level is. It's gain extremely valuable information. But it costs you. And this is the thing that really does cost you, which is well test. Now, you have to specifically design a well to be able to test it. Uh, you get several short hours, periods of flow, with various choke settings. Then you have to shut the well in, watch the pressure build up, like in this analysis here, to confirm that the well extends, uh, reservoir extends uh, some distance from the well. It's uh, flow testing confirms the capability of the reservoir to deliver. You can measure permeability. You can see various barriers, etc. Very highly valuable, essential for reserves booking. But again, you need to pre-design the well, so you need to know where where you are. Post drilling integration again highly important. If the well's been successful, well, what have you found? What are you going to do next? What's the impact? What's different to your model? If the well was failed, again, quite a painful experience. But why it was different? Why did the prospect fail? What can we learn? What's the impact? And you're part of a team, a big team of all of these wonderful people, both staff and contractors, putting everything together to deliver. So just finally, summary, safety is vital. So what can you do as a geologist to help you do that? What's the objective? What data do we need? Look at the hazards, 
identify the problems, work together, teamwork, drilling the well on paper, reporting, most importantly, dialogue. And what did we learn? What's the impact of the future? Thank you very much.